Hello everyone, welcome back to another devlog of our mini golf game. In this video, we'll be designing the main menu and game UI. For the UI, we like to use Figma. It's a quick and easy file to access and update throughout the project. You can see we already had some designs for the menu and some map ideas. As time went on, some ideas were scrapped and some lived on. Here you can see some doodles we made, and we'll work on the UI using this as our guide. Since your game has a resolution of 1024 by 576 we can't just copy everything. We want to make sure everything has enough space and will be visible on both PC and mobile devices. Let's make 4 frames and start adding some shapes. This will help us decide the size of various UI elements and easily edit them in other programs. First, let's start with the main menu. Let's add 3 rectangles and add text in the middle. These will be the buttons. One of them will definitely be the play button. We're still not sure what the other buttons will be. Maybe an option menu where you can toggle the sound and music on and off. Or maybe a tutorial to show the player how to play the game. So let's say that all three will be in the game and add the buttons so that we know what the button sizes will be. Somewhere on the top half of the screen we'll place a large rectangle for the title and another large rectangle on the right side of the screen for the mascot, more on that later. Now let's work on the UI while playing the game. Thankfully this will look a lot better since we had some game assets from our previous videos. In the empty frame I'm going to paste an image of map 1. This is what the player sees in the game. So what we need to think about now is how we can add some UI elements like score and a button that ends the game. If the player is on a PC, I'm not too worried since they're using a mouse or trackpad and both have great accuracy. The challenge is designing this to make it comfortable and easy for the players who play this on their phones. But I think I have an idea on how to tackle this problem. I'm going to create a 64x64 64 64 pixel square in both top corners. The left one will be the exit button, and the right one will be a zoom out button that will allow you to see the entire map. Finally, the scroll will be in the top center of the screen. Alright, let's work on the map selection screen. This is what the player will see when they press the play button. As mentioned in our previous videos, the golf courses are in space on floating islands. So from here you can choose a map that you want to play and try to get a perfect score. These islands will try to represent the actual map as you can see the examples on the screen. We still don't know how many maps we'll have, so I'm just going to put a bunch of circles in a pattern and those will be changed into maps later on. Depending on how well you do a map, you'll be awarded up to 3 stars. So let's add those under each circle and give them a different color. Of course, we need a way to return back to the main menu, so again, on the top left corner we add the back button. In the top right corner, we'll add a star shape and some numbers. This will show the player how many stars they have earned and the maximum number of stars in the game. But how do you get all the stars? After the ball sinks in the hole, a board will drop from the top of the screen. Here you'll see things like the map name, your final score, how many moves did it take you to win, and how many you need to get the next star. If you achieved all 3 stars, then instead of telling you how many shots you need for the next star, you're probably going to see our best score. And under that, we're adding 3 buttons that I think you can tell where they're going to take you after you press them. Whilst developing the game, you may have noticed the lack of characters. It may even raise a question if there's any point for such a simple golf game. And the answer to that question is yes. Unlike our previous two games, the character in this game will not be controlled by you. It's a character that serves more as a mentor who will show you how to play the game. His name is Rusty. We came up with that name when we tried making the game in Rust. So the game would be called Rusty's Mini Golf, as you're playing on his golf course. After we switched from Rust to Godot, we had an issue with that name. We're not going to call it Godot's Mini Golf rather find another way around it. Rusty in pop culture is a commonly used name for a prospector, so... Young Rusty was working 18 hours a day in a coal mine, not happy with his income and wondering how long he can support himself and his pet armadillo. On a day off, while river dancing, he found some gold nuggets. He decided on buying a spaceship and venturing off into space with his beloved pet. A long period of time has passed when Rusty spent most of his days relaxing when... boredom struck. To alleviate the boredom, Rusty decided to do what he does best and craft a golf course on several asteroids. Does the story make sense? No. Will it be mentioned in the game? Probably not. But in my opinion, giving a character a bizarre story, or any story for that matter, makes things a lot more interesting. Oh yeah, also the armadillo doesn't have a name so feel free to call him Godoy. This is an idea we had for the title. Basically, there'll be a billboard that says Rusty, and the words mini golf under that. We were thinking of making some letters look like they belong to a golf course. An example of that is the letter I being a flag, and the letter O being a golf ball. This is something that takes a lot of time and changes often, and there's not much more I can say about the title really. 
When we're done with the final design, you'll be able to see it in the game. Regarding the buttons, now that we have the button sizes, we can start creating them. Starting off with the easy ones that are 64 by 64 pixels, we fill the canvas with a brown color and remove a few pixels off the edges. To add some contrast, we give our shape a yellow outline. This will be a base for our small buttons. On the new layer, we draw an arrow, this will be the back button. And on the another layer, we create a magnifying glass icon, this will be the zoom out button. So we have two button sizes, I'll copy the size of both from Figma and create two rectangles. Paste the appropriate size and start adding detail. There are going to be wooden signs with a yellow outline like the small buttons I've just made. But this time, I'm going to give them some extra detail so they actually look like they're made out of wood. Duplicate these two buttons and make a darker version for the press state of the button. Repeat the process apart from the press state for the scoreboard. Apart from having more space for extra detail, we think it would be cool if the board was attached to some ropes. I'll just do the left side then copy paste it to the right side. Now that we have our new temporary assets, we go back to Figma and replace the grey shapes. They don't look all that good I know, but the asset sizes are most likely going to stay the same and that allows us to start adding them to Godot. Alright, let's put the new assets to use by creating a main menu scene. I'm going to zoom my canvas to fit and review the reference art. We're going to have some buttons for navigation on the left side and some static images on the right. Before I make any changes, I'll adjust the anchor point of the root node to take up the entire screen. Now I'm going to add a VBox container node. A VBox container is used for elements that are stacked vertically. I'll rename it to navigation so we know what it's used for. Now I'll add a button element and duplicate it twice. Notice how they're stacked vertically as I just mentioned. Then I'll rename the buttons to Play, Tutorial and Options as we saw in the reference art. I'll also populate the button's text fields. Then I'll anchor the VBox to the center left. These elements are using Godot's default UI style. They're pretty minimal, so we're going to want to make our own. Inside my UI folder, I'm going to add a couple of resources. First, a theme resource. I'll name it Button Theme. Then I'm going to add free stylebox texture resources. One for idle buttons, one for when we hover over buttons, and one for when we click on buttons. A theme on its own doesn't allow for much customization. Instead, we need to import properties that we want to customize into the theme. For now, I only want to edit the background image of the buttons, so I'll only import the style boxes. We can dismiss this warning, we got what we needed. Now, notice that we have various theme tabs in the bottom right area of the screen. I'll switch to the style box tab and drag the resources I created a moment ago into the respective slots. So, normal goes on top of normal, hover on hover, and I just noticed that Godot uses the word pressed for items that are being clicked on, so I'll rename my asset to keep in line with the naming scheme. This folder is starting to look a little too busy, so I'm going to create a new folder for all the generic menu button assets. We can customize the style boxes by clicking the resource in the style tab, and here I can assign a custom background to this button by dragging a texture. I'll do the same for the hover and press styles too. Here comes the payoff. We can now apply this custom theme to our buttons in the inspector. Let's preview the scene as well to see our new theme in action. Notice how the button's background texture changes when we hover over it and click on it. This is a good start, but we can do way better. Here's a look at the font we'll be using in our game. By the way, always check the license before using third-party assets from the internet. This particular font happens to be free for personal and commercial use. I'm going to make a subfolder for fonts and only drag the TTF file in here. We don't care about the rest of the files. Remember that I mentioned a moment ago that we have to explicitly import the style properties we want to edit. We're going to import font properties now. Now I can navigate to the font tab and drag my custom font over. And notice how the font immediately changes in the scene. The button looks very cramped, so let's give it some space. We can navigate to any of our styles and adjust the content margin property. I'll give all four sides a value of 5 pixels to give the button some breathing room. This is starting to look much better, but notice how the font looks a bit blurry. We can fix this by adjusting the font settings. Double click the TTF file in the sidebar to access this panel. I find that adjusting the oversampling slider is the easiest way to fix the blur. I'll bump it up a bit and re-import. Notice how the font is immediately sharper in the scene. You might be tempted to drag the oversampling all the way to the top, but then notice that when I preview the game that the font looks too choppy now. 
A value of 2 is a good sweet spot for our project, considering that we're running at a low resolution. Okay, now we're pretty happy with the button, so let's look at the scene at large. The size of our scene is depicted by this blue line, and our buttons are hardly taking up any space at all. Let's change that. I'm going to increase the separation property of the VBox container to add more space between buttons. Then I'll move the container a bit to the right so it's not pressed up against the edge. If we have another look at our reference art, we see that the buttons have more padding, so let's adjust this. Remember the content margin property from before? I'm going to raise it even higher. Let's go with 15 pixels on each edge. And as a final touch, I'm going to increase the font size. So, just like before, if we want to alter a style, we need to import it into our theme first. Now we can go to the font size tab and edit the size. 24 looks good. Let's preview our change now. I'm pretty happy with this. Let's check the reference art again. All we're missing now is the two static images. I'll start with the logo. I'll add a texture rect node for it and assign it a texture. Then I'm going to anchor it to the top right of the screen. Let's do the same for Rusty, the mascot. I'm going to anchor him down to the bottom right. And then tick the flip H property so he's facing the left side. I'll rename the nodes so we know what they represent. We should resize the images so they don't overlap. I'm going to slide the scale slider until I find a value that I'm happy with. 0.75 seems to work well. I'll move the logo a bit to the side. Then I'll move Rusty to the side a little bit, making sure he's slightly hanging off the screen like in the reference art. All we're missing now is the background. We don't have any custom background asset at the moment, so I'm just going to copy a tile map background from our test level. There we go. Pretty fancy. For the cherry on top, let's create a custom cursor. We can easily do this via the project settings. However, our cursor sprite is a sheet consisting of two tiles, one for an idle state and one for clicking. As you can see, this solution isn't suitable at all. We get both cursor sprites on the screen at once, so let's undo this change. What does the documentation have to say about this? They propose two methods. One is via the project settings, which we just tried. They even mention here that this is only for simple use cases due to its limitations. The other method is via scripting. We're not afraid of code on this channel, so let's do it that way. The example script in the documentation expects us to have two separate sprites, so I'm going to start by loading up the cursor sheet and exporting the individual frames. I'm going to call them cursor arrow and cursor beam in order to use the same names as in the documentation. I can get rid of the combined sheet now, we don't need it anymore. I'll create a custom cursor scene and assign it a script, and I'll simply copy the code straight from the documentation. The only adjustment that I need to make is to the file paths. I'm going to point it to the new files that I just exported. I'm going to add this custom cursor as a node to our main menu scene. Let's try it out live. Notice that the default mouse cursor has been replaced, but nothing happens when we click. So what's happening? Let's see what the documentation has to say. I'll follow this link to the page that describes the various cursor states and I'll search for iBeam, which is the mouse state we're using for clicks. As you can see here, it's meant to be used in conjunction with text boxes, but it's also the only mouse state that even mentions clicking. So let's try an experiment. I'm going to add a process method and listen for mouse clicks. If we detect a click with the left mouse button, then we're going to set the mouse cursor. Now let's try it out. And how about that? It actually works. To be honest, I don't understand why this is working. We're still only changing the cursor for the I-beam state. If you have any idea, please leave a comment, I'd love to know. Let's make one final change. The best part about having the custom cursor as a scene is that we can just drop it in anywhere. Like in the test level you saw in the last episode. Amazing, it almost looks like a proper game now. That's it for today. Join us next time for some added polish, quality of life improvements, and some new levels. Go ahead and give us a follow if you'd like to keep up with the development process. Thanks for watching and see you next time.